welcome everybody to um, uh, this new iteration or next iteration of the IELTS Online Expert Forum. And this time we will talk about the future of corpus linguistics. And I have um, gathered a very illustrious um, group of experts here uh, to actually in the same um, place. So I welcome Michaela Marlberg and Lawrence Anthony, who are both in Erlangen, I presume. And then there is Nico Leitinen from Johansson. So just to give you an idea what today will be like, um, after my very short introduction, uh, then I'll give uh, the panelists a few minutes to introduce themselves and maybe tell us a little bit about uh, their initial ideas on the future of corpus linguistics. And then we'll start with an open panel discussion where I'll ask an initial question to the panelists. And then essentially uh, they will um, answer and we'll start to have a open discussion on the topic. And the last 20 minutes uh, is reserved for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, you can uh, then when we end recording, which will be uh, after the uh, panel discussion, you can then ask your questions in the chat, or you can also unmute yourself and raise your hand. And I'll then uh, pick those who can ask questions. All right, that was it from my end with introduction. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Michaela Marberg to introduce herself and maybe give us uh, an initial idea of her stance on the future of corpus linguistics. Okay, so hello everyone. Can you hear me all right? Does the microphone pick this up as it should? Okay, fantastic. So I'm Michaela Malberg, and I'm here now at FAU in Germany. I've been at this university since April, so not an awfully long time and it's absolutely fabulous to already have the first visitors to the place, so that is really good. Um, a few things I want to say about my career trajectory, because I think this is important for the way I view the future of corpus linguistics. So I started off with um, a first degree in English and mathematics, and then I did a PhD in English linguistics. And then I think what was really interesting was the kind of job titles I had, because I started with a chair at the University of Nottingham that was called a chair in English language and linguistics. And when I moved to Birmingham, I became professor of corpus linguistics. And now here at FAU, I'm now professor of digital humanities. And you see how this kind of moved around a bit, you know, from the more English language and linguistics to now we are all into humanities and somewhere in between there's methods and corpus linguistics. In spite of all these various job titles, it was always the same question that I think has always interested me. And that is, how do we make sense of the world through language? So it's really about making sense of what is going on, looking at language as a social phenomenon. And corpus linguistics has given us methods and tools and brilliant software and stuff that we can use to find patterns, identify patterns, interpret patterns. So see what language does for our meaning making, for our sense making, see what society makes of the world through the patterns that we have. And at the beginning, when corpus linguistics started off, these methods, so really the technology, the computers, this was something that was absolutely vital. And at the beginning, everyone talked about the revolution and all the rest of it. And now the whole world is really digital. And some of our methods, they sometimes look a bit like homemade or some of the interfaces look a bit like, yeah, it does the job. And then we've got people who really like the command line and that is a good thing and all the rest of it. But there's now so much out there that corpus linguistics isn't so exceptional or different than it was like 50, 60 years ago. And I think that is something to take yeah, into account when we think about the future. So I want in my little statement, so this is really just a short statement. I think there are three headings under which I see the future of corpus linguistics. And for me, this is one theory, two stories, and three, real world action. 
And I just explain this very briefly. So theory, I've always been occupied with theory. So back in 2005, when this book came out, that really was the publication of my PhD, I proposed what I then called this corpus theoretical approach. And back then, and Miko, I think we were at some of these co uh, conferences at the very beginning, and Lawrence, I met you at some of these early conferences for me, there was a lot of debate about, is corpus linguistics just a method? Mm. Is there any theory in it at all? And people got so upset. You know, there was really like, there was so much emotion in these discussions. And then it felt it quieted down a bit. And it seems people had settled on, okay, it is just methodology or it's mainly methodology and theory comes in from the other disciplines, from other areas of linguistics. But I still feel the theory has always been there and I can't summarize the whole problem of the theory here now, but I think for me, theory has always been about what do we do with the data? What is the relationship between data and society? Isn't It isn't just using some data, doing something with it, making it look nice. It's also how we collect it, how we make assumptions about what it means to look at data to understand society. So there is always a lot of theoretical stuff behind it in the way we use language to do things and the data is evidence of what we do. So I think we can't do without theory and the connectedness. And at this point in time, in the whole context of AI, I think we need theory more than ever. Now is the time to really have some linguistics in the technology. And that is where I see our position as corpus linguists. Then the stories, and that is something, when you look at corpus data, we have moved past this is all bag of words, so no one would claim it's bag of words, but still we haven't looked enough at the connectedness, because even if we collect data in corpora, we need to look at sequence, we need to look at time, we need to look at cohesion, we need to look at connectedness. We don't just use language in the form of words and phrases, we use language in the form of stories and narratives and making sense of the world. I think they're lost for the moment. All right? Let's just give them a moment to recover. Yeah. You're back now. Oh, so what did you miss? So the, the important point about storytelling, so that what we really do is when we make sense of the world through language, we do this in stories and narratives. We don't just communicate in words and phrases, in grammatical patterns, in cohesive connections. It's stories and narratives with protagonists, with time sequences, with um, plots where it matters when things happen. So that is this one. And the third one is the real world action. Because here we are very good at looking at data retrospectively in corpus linguistics. So we collect corpora, then we have data, and that is data of stuff that happened in the past. And I think what we need to do more is we need to take a retro, we need to move from the retrospective to the forward looking and proactive stance mm. and say, now that we have understood what happened in the past, where as corpus linguists, do we come in to actually have an impact on the discourse, on the narrative? Where do we help people with understanding how storytelling works? And this is for me, all the work that I'm doing at the moment on climate communication. You know, it is all about, it isn't enough to describe the story, you need to actually make a contribution so that people can change the story, so that the narrative can move into a certain direction. So to sum up, for me, it's these three things. It's really the theory, the story, and the real world action where I think we can do more. And this is where our future is in the digital world, in the face of AI and everything that's happening. That is my statement, and I'll leave it here. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. So that's, that. yeah that actually feeds well into how it's developed and where it's going in the future, right? And especially the concept of uh, narratives, right? And how how we as humans, as uh, narrative beings, basically fit into that. Lawrence, I'd like you to to basically tell us a little about your about yourself and maybe tell us about your stance uh, towards the future of corpus linguistics. 
Okay, uh, there is a, an interesting parallel with what Michelle was just saying as well. So I'm a professor uh, at Waseda University in Japan, uh, but my background also is related to mathematics. I started out doing mathematical physics uh, at Manchester University of Institute, uh, Manchester, Manchester University's Institute of Science and Technology, or UMIST. Uh, but then I went on and went to Birmingham, did my master's and a PhD in applied linguistics. So I moved, you know, from that mathematical background into into linguistics. And for my PhD, I was doing work in, with, in AI, applying AI techniques to discourse analysis, which is kind of an interesting thing that's kind of coming back now, I feel. So my interest has always basically been um, corpus linguistics as a scientific approach to, um, to language understanding. I've also been always interested in educational technology, applying tools and methods, and, and developing tools and methods to, to hopefully take the field forward in some way. Uh, so at the moment, we have this very interesting um, development, uh, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about quite a bit over the next hour or so, uh, about um, AI and li large language models and the influence of those on corpus linguistics. Um, so I would say when we talk about the future of corpus linguistics, I kind of I have three points as well. Um, as Michaela had, but it's all related to AI. I'm just going to focus on AI for my part here. So it's really, the summary would be something like embrace AI. Um, but that doesn't mean just go in with AI and just like trust it and believe it and just go and forget everything that we've done in the past. Because we do have interesting theory, going back to what Michaela was saying, uh, especially the work of John Sinclair and, how, and his ideas have really... Um, in some way being brought into this whole new large language modeling approach. But the idea of embracing AI is first, at least understand it. So have an understanding of what these new AI models are doing, because if we understand what they're doing, then maybe they have some insight for our own work. So we should also be not only understanding them, but thinking, okay, where can we contribute? How does that fit into our model of language? Is there other areas where we can maybe even make these models better or make take the AI field in a different direction? So understanding AI, but also then contributing to this new development of, of tech, tools and techniques. And also there's an interesting area of learning from AI in the sense, not just of the technology, but how the world has embraced them. I mean, we've only had these new large language models over the past two, three years, but they've taken the world by storm. Why? Why does why do normal people, general people in the streets, start downloading ChatGPT and start using it to to generate language and understand language and, and so on? Um, what can we learn as a field from that? Um, maybe corpus linguistics needs to be more well. Some part of corpus linguistics needs to be brought into the real world. For example, language teaching, language learning, and all these other aspects. I'm not sure if we're always there. Focusing on the theory is definitely important, and, uh, and I think we can learn a lot from these models in that respect. But we also then need the applications and the practical uses of corpus linguistics in the real world. I think that would capture the imagination of the audience too. And I'll stop there. Yeah, um, I think LLMs do have uh, had a, or are having a revolutionary effect. So I completely concur. Maybe we can talk later more about um, the connection between AI, LLMs, and corpus linguistics. But um, I'd now like to uh, hand over to Miko and ask him about who he is and how he's connected to corpus linguistics and how he sees his, its future. Thank you, Martin. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, good. So uh, I'm uh, Mikko Laitinen. Uh, I work as a professor of English language and culture uh, at, at UEF, so the University of Eastern Finland, in Finland, of course. Uh, thanks for the invitation, first of all. I think that this is a wonderful initiative. So it's it's good to good to see so many faces, first of all, in the audience, familiar faces and familiar names, and of course, my you know, so Martin, thanks for organizing this. Uh, I've worked with corpora since the late 1990s, so not very long time, you know, looking at some of my 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 more experienced colleagues. But the first sort of a contact point with corpus linguistics was I, when I signed up for a seminar in Helsinki, led by Tertu Nevalainen. And, and, and so so that was sort of a, when, when I first 
came across the idea that, oh, well, we have these, you know, wonderful collections of text and that were used uh, not through a graphic interface, but MS-DOS based command lines, search, uh, search interfaces and, and, and so on. And I did my, uh, I guess I'm the odd one out of, out of the panelists. I've never studied mathematics in, in you know, formal mathematical training. I actually, it was, was very lousy. I, I, I like, like to tell all my students that I was lousy in math, you know, back in the school days. But then, you know, suddenly, uh, the, you know, statistics in particular made sense to me. They kind of a number started talking to me and I started seeing that, OK, well, here's what, what we can use, you know, statistics for um, to our uh, to our advantage. Uh, but, it, but I ended up doing my, my PhD in a sort of a, using a very small but a very rich uh, diachronic corpus uh, of of personal letters from from the early modern english period uh, and that was a sort of an eye opener in many ways and i got, got, you know dug deeper into the field and uh, but today i work with uh, large scale social media data uh, trying to think of you know that how can, how could a corpus linguist what could a corpus linguist do with the, with these very large scale materials? Um, and I'm going to mention two two of my sort of uh, two projects that I'm 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 right now doing that have to do with sort of a um, social media material and, and social media in linguistics and in the humanities in general. They're, they're they're in many ways important because they sort of highlight the the kind of a, the expansion of the field and this type of a sort of a data a data um, data intensive field as a whole the first one is a sort of a uh, research infrastructure project uh by the by the research council in this country we are part of a a large consortium uh, uh funded by the by the finnish research infrastructures uh, the basically con consists of us, a couple of linguists, uh, but mainly historians, you know, culture, cultural historians, and and so on. And and our sort of a part in the in the consortium is to focus on sort of a, uh, collecting, uh, pre-processing, collecting, enriching, making large-scale social media data available. But there's a sort of an you know very interesting point behind this is that we're the only ones in the in the social sciences and humanities funded by this by this research infrastructure scheme uh, everybody else the you know measurements uh, and machinery from heart sciences and, and 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 so but our consortium is really sort of a uh, focused on, on collecting collecting data, making data available in the formats and 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 in ways that that many people in social sciences and humanities, can use and then the other one is a sort of a, a, a project that's we're about to start in in september in a sense we we test uh, the social network hypothesis or the weak tie hypothesis in social linguistics which has traditionally been you, you know studied using very small scale data kind of ethnographic observation data and we wanted to expand this into into or, or tested in in in, in large-scale social media data so kind of a uh, trying to see if novel data sets and very large data sets could actually provide new answers to old questions in the humanities uh, so i guess my 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 five cents into the discussion is that you know one, one potential path for the future in corpus linguistics is to to make sure that that we can use user-generated texts and metadata from social media for the simple fact that that it's been estimated that 60 to 90 percent of the world population use some social media one social media application on, or another so in a sense that it provides us with a sort of an immensely large and potentially large and potentially beneficial uh platform in in the future mm -hmm. uh there are three big issues that I wanted to throw, you know, uh, or put, put on the table right away. Three big issues or, or three big challenges that deal with, you know, when we of how we can of whether we can use social media data in in linguistics um, and, and and kind of a, what what implications that actually has. The first one is not really a challenge but an implication. 
I think it changes the, our primary level of analysis a bit. Uh, if we think of traditional corpora, you know, the unit that is that has an ID is typically a text. It's a new, it's a news piece. It's a one text that you know ends up in a in a in a in, in, a, in a digital corpus, whether that be a sort of a news story or or, or a fictional you know essay or, or or novel and things like that. But if we look at the social media. It's not the text. I mean, texts are, have a label. They usually have an ID, but the primary level on the on social media is on the individual, and that I think is open opens up a whole new world of possibilities. You know, uh, of communities and how we are connected to people and, and and to other people and how other people that we know are connected to the others and so on. So primary level of analysis is a, is a bit different in terms of social media. Mm -hmm. Then the second yeah. point, Martin, two minutes only. Uh, the second point is a challenge. So really the large scale of social media is a challenge. We need cross-disciplinary collaboration. We need more computer scientists in this field. And that I think connects to what Mikaela was saying in a sense, we can't leave it in the hands of the computer scientists only. We need cross-disciplinary collaboration. And the third point is the, the third challenge is the data availability. I think we have seen a massive sort of a closing down the data sources when it comes to social media data. And, and it's, it would be very important for societies like ILE to use their voice and to be, to be sort of a societally relevant to ensure that you know data would be for research in the future as well. I know that I spent more than five minutes. No, that, that's fine, right? Martin, um, so thanks for this. You're very welcome. Um, all of the panelists are very, very welcome. And I'm very, very grateful that you uh, agreed to be part of this panel. Maybe just a word about myself. My, my name is Martin Schweinberger. I work at the University of Queensland. And I started out as a philosopher and came late to the game in 2008 in corpus linguistics. And then uh, it, I turned very quantitative. And I'm a quantitative corpus linguist, and I've also I'm involved in some big projects on uh, research uh, infrastructure and uh, language data science. So um, I have prepared a couple of questions, but based on your introductions, I'd actually change that a little bit, because from all of your um, stances and introductions, I see that now uh, what if we have in common that you see corpus linguistics as branching out. Um, to other disciplines, with uh, with Miku, it was more the social sciences, the network analysis. With uh, Lawrence, it was more the computational side of thing, computer science with the LLMs and AI. And with Michaela, it was more like the discourse uh, studies, if I if I see correctly. So, given given that branching out, I'd like to basically ask ask Michaela. Uh, what she considers the future of corpora to look like. So not of corpus linguistics, but when you think about corpora and how we treat them, um, mm. what would be your ideas of how that will develop in the future? Mm. Yeah, so I think we need in the future, it would be good to get a lot more diverse corpora, but also corpora that we are trying to look at, not just from our perspective, but outward looking from the perspective of other disciplines. So, because a lot of data out there now is language data and so much data is available. And as we've seen with AI and the large language models, what's out there will be used. And the danger is that a lot of this can be used very uncritically. So, you know, you use what is easy accessible and then you just take all the bias that you have in the real world, put it into your large language model, and then you get the same bias that you had before and um, only supported by algorithms that then make suggestions for you to perpetuate the bias, to just uh, say this in a very exaggerated way. But also um, it's kind of, there's a lot in terms of data equality. There are terms now like data feminism. There are things um, where you really need to think about data ethics and all this. And this is where corpus linguists can really help produce and curate 
data, create corpora, but also create data standards, guidelines, ideas, ways of looking at things. And I really liked Miko's point about what is the role of Isle in this? I mean, a society like this is really positioned, this is prime place to say, we need to think about society and how we construct corpora or how we use data as corpora, and then think about equality, diversity, inclusion, and, and all these factors. So what I'd like to see is more diverse corpora, but also, you know, critical thinking about accessibility, because a lot of the data that is used is not necessarily available to us in an easy way. You know, all these proprietary algorithms that you can't get behind, the data sets that are behind paywalls and the influence that is associated with this. And we need to have a position on this and what that means for our way of looking at data. Right, but don't, don't you think it's also like our job in a way to, so it's part of your answer, right? But don't you think it's also our part to then basically compile and provide data that is rich yeah. enough that, that people absolutely. can use, right? Yes, 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 absolutely. But in this digital world, you know, finding a way in that world where we say we know what people are using, what they're interested in, and then we need to think about how would we suggest we need to create corpora? What are the standards? What kind of reference points do we need? What can we give people as a gold standard and say, how does your data set measure up to this? Because we've thought about it in this, this and the other way. So absolutely, yes. And that is where the theory comes in. That is the linguistics. That is something where you need to think about language. But let me let me lead to to Lawrence, right? Because let me play devil's advocate. In so because when you look at the data that large language models use, right, they actually don't need rich data, right? They they create their own richness and they it's not annotated, right? It's not annotated in any way. So everything that's in there basically is is more or less uh, data inherent. So it's not the data that we typically have. We have annotation that we know where the text is from, the speaker and everything like that. So the data that large language models build on are, are basically just uh, un, unfiltered, unannotated data. It's just raw data. So that actually mm -hmm. contrasts with your with your uh, idea of, of corpora, right? And right uh, compilation representativeness in that. Lawrence, so, I, know that, I know that you're very interested in AI and LMA. So, so what do you I, there's a lot of interest, as I was saying about learning from AI in some sense, but also you know learning from corpora. Uh, what we found is that uh, when uh, LLMs were first created, they didn't care about anything about the data and just like they would you know scrape the web and build a, build a model from that. And they have been successful. So yes, there is an argument that we don't need to tag the data. We don't need to annotate it. And following almost like the swell, uh, uh, sorry, Sinclairian view of language, mm -hmm. the patterns of, of grammar or, or other features of language emerge from the usage. I think that's a very important thing. So maybe we shouldn't be assigning these very clear cut tags or annotations to data. But on the other hand, what's recently being noticed is that um, better models can be created with better data. So if we have cleaner sets of, of data when we're trying to build a language model, you need less training time and, and the quality is better. And we also know that language models make a lot of mistakes in certain kinds of genres and certain types of questions and so on. So that would indicate that maybe we do need to um, take into consideration genres and registers and so on. Uh, in a superficial level, they can change the, 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 the register and speak like a pirate, for example. But when we actually do more sophisticated um, language generation, maybe we need more sophisticated um, input. And that would suggest that, again, corpus linguists have a role in determining or advising um, language model engineers, like what kind of data should be put into the model and what kind of features should they be at least aware of. The models need to be aware of certain features, which um, at the moment, Maybe they don't emerge out of the data that we're giving them because the data is so dirty and so on. So I think there's a lot of lessons there. Yes, we don't; we, they don't require these fixed labels, but um, 
maybe having some more data would, uh, sorry, more, more insight into the data would help the performance. So I think we have a contribution there. Hmm. Can I can I ask you, because when, when Michaela talks about corpulency, right, that, that's very much what I understand in a way, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm a simple person. And how we analyze language uh, using corpora to me is very clear. But it's not clear to me how we can analyze language using LLMs. Could you maybe say more about the role or the function of LLMs for corpus linguistics? Right. I, I think that they're really transformative, right? I agree. And I've used aspects of them myself. But when you mm. when I think about traditional corpus linguistics or what people are doing now, I don't really see that very clear connections. Could could you maybe a little, uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? So this goes into quite a deep discussion about what language models are and what they represent. But in a very simple way, I would say a language model is a model of language. So if we understand it's a model of language and it seems to perform very well at certain tasks, that would suggest that the underlying model that it's adopting is in some sense interesting because it can produce such native-like and such natural language. So I think we can look at that model and learn from it. And if you actually do that, if you look at what's inside the language model, it's very Sin uh, John Sinclair-like in the sense that it's usage, it's basically yep. purely usage-based. Yes. So, so we can learn from that, but um, so that is the insight to, to language that the model gives us, but we already had that from Sinclair. So, uh, and, and others, and, you know, pattern uh, grammar and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and here's a yep. point, sorry. It's one I really yep. need to come in because yeah, yeah. my, you know, the way, so that there's no misunderstanding, you know, yep. so I'm not arguing for here, we need neat and clear corpus linguistics and everything needs to be tidy and all the rest no, of it. No. Some, yep. Something I've always said is corpus linguistics in a nutshell, it's all about frequency. It is always about frequency. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is something that from the beginning has always been there. We just decided to channel what we would look at as acceptable frequency for us mm -hmm. to look at at any one point in time. Mm -hmm. Now, what the large language models have done, they've done away with our channeling and, you know, they've kicked out the signposting and now the frequency is just all over the shop. And now it's just frequency and we are dealing with that in a different way. But it's still the same underlying problem that language, that fundamentally to language, frequency is really key. What is said very frequently is meanings that are relevant to society. And that is what we also see in the way data is collected like this. This is why ChatGPT works, because people have said it often enough. It's been yeah. seen sufficiently often so that you can parrot it if you want to. And that is the gist of it. What we need is a lens as to where does the frequency come from? What mm -hmm. is behind it in terms of the power, potentially the equality, the inequality? I mean, I don't want to go all the way to rigging elections. That might become a topic very soon. We don't know how this is going to pan out in a couple of um, weeks' time. You know, but that is also frequency. You, you know, this is how messaging works. You say it often enough, and at some point, people start saying it again. And, you know, that is part of this problem. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But I mean, the fundamental novelty of, of LMs to me was really not the frequency and the collocations and stuff, which is very corpusive. Um, the, the point was the instructions. So the problem is that, for example, if you would ask ChatGPT, what is the capital of Germany? And you didn't give it like instructions, what question answering looks like. Uh, the answer would not be Berlin, but the answer would be, what's the capital of the United States? Or what's the capital of Czech? Because it wouldn't understand how dialogue mm. works, right? And that's, mm. I think, why, why your answer was beautiful, that you basically need to look at conversations and dialogues and time, I, right? Lawrence, I'd like to add a point, that, a point here, though. I think this is, this is part of the com, um, confusion about language models. They are, there are mm -hmm. two very separate components to a language model. Yes. The mm -hmm. One is the encoding and one is the decoding. Mm -hmm. And the prompting aspect is all about its generative ability, how it generates language by predicting the next word. And that obviously is going to be very heavily dependent on how you prompt it, because the prompt will, the next most probable word after a prompt is going to be very different depending on the prompt. But what I find, I think we need to look at more is the 
the encoding model, this is the embedding model, the word embedding model and the contextual information that that stores in its 1,200 or whatever dimensions, that aspect is not um, um, related to the prompt at all. It has inside its mind, in some sense, a very interesting model of language, very usage, it's driven by usage, mm -hmm. driven by frequency, driven by context, driven by all, a lot of different features that are represented in these dimensions. So I think that's where, you know, cultural linguistics can go and look at how it's doing that. Mm -hmm. And maybe contribute to that. Let me, let me, let me actually switch over to, to Mikko, right? Because we've talked about the language models now, but we haven't talked about the network of users, which is not really in that kind of realm if you look at it, right? So I'd really like to bring Mikko in because lots of corporate studies have looked at users, right? Or speakers, sorry, not users in this context. Mm -hmm. And because Mikko is also similar in that sense because he looks at large data and data intensive kind of approaches, right? But he's very interested in not the language per se, but the users or the speakers. So Miko, how, how would you how would you then see that, right? So where's the potential for network analyses and network approaches on social media data in that new realm that we are trying to try for, that we're trying to you know create a scheme of? A big question. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I think the I'm I'm not an expert on on LLMs in any way, so I can't. Really, so if I say something, you know, totally, you know, stupid here, just please, you know, those those of you who know more than I do, then then, then please. I, I should me. I, I yeah. should actually say. So this panel is not about AI, right? It's more yeah, exactly. Really, exactly. Uh, yeah. But overall, I think you know this is, uh, in a sense, that these types of sort of a purely text-based approaches you know, that you know, as a social linguist, I've I've always sort of wondered if that you know, or, or felt that there's a sort of a layer missing, you know, that is the layer of variation, that is the layer of you know how our communities or how our identities that we have, our identities that we have, how they actually sort of uh, you know are reflected in, in in the language production, and I'm not sure. I haven't prompt actually prompted this with 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 ChatGPT or any any other tools, or whether sort of a we can whether we'd be able to 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 sort of a, um, whether the output would be some something that would be sort of a social linguistically delicate in a sense that it would reflect the the social linguistic realities that we see. Or the fact that the fact that you know certain types of communities, for instance, develop their own mm -hmm. own ways of speaking and things like that, or whether so mm -hmm. so so whether the 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 actual models are are, are sort of a, aware of their variation. I guess that's that mm -hmm. that's what always that that's what has has sort of a, I've been thinking about this not in terms of research, but in terms of sort of when I look at the the the, the development of the huge speed in which large language models have been have been developed overall i think you know we have a window of opportunity i think this is a sort of again one one of those things that i wanted to highlight in this i mean the fact that that the large language that they're called large language models have really been has has led at least i see this in my daily life when people from other departments contact us you know more frequently than they, than what they used to, to do in the past because of the, the fact that it has changed the the entire ways that that outside the academia from from outside our circle views linguistics and language studies as a whole rather than sort of a the old-fashioned way would be to look at the prepositions and blah 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 whatever but right now you know there's a sort of a one great deal of interest in terms of you know how how we are viewed, and I think that's a—it's a sort of an opportunity that that we we should not waste. Mm -hmm. I guess that's but, my my five cents into this. No, I, I completely agree. Right, there, there is definitely an interest, right? Yeah. Um, how, how would you how would you then see the role of social media data, right? Because that's what what you focus on, and over the last five to ten years, right, mm -hmm. the, the people have been using social media data to do very very interesting ways of looking at language change and you know mm -hmm. uh, how innovation spread like Jack Reed for example right yeah. so how, how does social media data then feed, feed into the future of course yeah 
again, I wanted to come back to this uh, to this question of what what's the primary unit of analysis. I think that it's the as the individual. Uh, I, I, my my gut feeling is that we've only seen the beginning. We've seen what uh, you know really good studies that really sort of a pioneering studies that make use of so that treat social media as a corpus. Mm. Uh, but what I think that maybe you know something that that will come in the future uh, more and more is that we start to take into account the the individuals and their and the communities where we live in and the individual variation that we see so the verb, you know i guess social media challenges us a bit in a sense that if we ask these sort of a traditional questions in linguistics let's say you know i mean traditional question is for instance you know textual variation genre differences i think that there's they're really wonderful studies and i hope that nobody you know sort of misunderstands me but you know if we keep on asking these, these the same questions that we have asked, you know, the kind of a, from a text analytics perspective with social media, then we end up in, in, on the wrong tracks because of the fact that the unit of analysis is is different, and that is the individual variation. So we mm -hmm. kind of need to to start looking at a lot more variation than than sort of a traditional, let's say register variation for instance in terms in, mm. in, when it comes to social media use i i've sometimes said to my all my students who are interested in this that now you're on the way of becoming social linguists you mm. were social linguists in the beginning you know to start with but now you know you have to start to look at the 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 primary data from a social perspective and and the because of the fact that you know each user has a, an individual identifier yeah i agree like as a social linguist this this is, is very close to to you know what, what i'm interested in too but i'm uh i'm very much afraid we have to end the panel discussion part of the forum here uh the time went over so swiftly it's unbelievable there's so many routes to take and many interesting ideas uh, let me just, uh, before I end uh, the recording, before we move over to the uh, question and answer uh, part of this forum, let me just highlight that the next forum will be on September 19. It will be moderated not by me, but by uh, Claire Childs. Uh, the topic will be announced. We'll uh, advertise it on the IELTS website as well, uh, well as on social media. So stay tuned for uh, more um IELTS expert online forums, and I'll end the recording here for everybody who's uh, watching this online, and we'll continue with the uh, audience Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>